Representative Nash, uh, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members uh, for coming uh, early in the morning for this informational hearing on 4152. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, you've seen the, the craft beverage industry, wine, beer, and spirits really has changed the, the landscape of, of what consumers want in Minnesota. And what we're hearing today is obviously informational, but we're hearing from interested stakeholders, uh, many of whom are to or from my district uh, that are in favor of, of having this conversation about how do Minnesotans have access and where can they purchase uh, these Minnesota-made products. Uh, and there are advocates for having it in grocery stores. And I just, uh, I, I just want to have a really uh, healthy conversation to begin um, understanding where Minnesotans are. Again, I think the response has been overwhelming for craft spirits, distilled uh, wines and beer. And uh, I, I have a number of testifiers and want to let them have the bulk of the time. So uh, Mr. Chair, I will, I will let them get going. That sounds good, Representative Nash. Thank you. And before we start with the testifiers, we're, Representative Hillstrom has a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Nash, can you tell me where in your bill it just says Minnesota made products would be allowed to be in these places? I believe your bill as written would allow any product. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Hillstrom, line 2.22 to 2.24, Minnesota Dispilled Spirits uh, says authorizes the food retailer to sell malt, liquor, wine, and Minnesota Distilled Spirits. Representative Hillstrom. So, so, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Nash, so to be clear, you're saying malt, liquor, and wine, and then only Minnesota distilled spirits. So it would be anybody's wine and anybody's no. malt liquor, just Minnesota. And, Mr. Chair, Representative Hillstrom, I believe that was a, a drafting error. I want Minnesota uh, malt, like, malt beverages, Minnesota wine, and Minnesota distilled spirits. So, Representative Hillstrom. But that's where it is in the bill. Good catch, and we appreciate your uh, help with working on the bill. I'm helping here, Mr. <laughs> oh, you are. You are. <laughs> I feel the help. I feel the help. Uh, Ms. Poole, go ahead. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you. My name is Jamie Poole, and I'm here today wearing two hats, president of the Minnesota Grocers Association and president of the Minnesota Marketplace Alcohol Alliance. I am going to keep my comments incredibly brief because we have a, a lot of folks here in industry that would like to share their thoughts today. Um, but I just appreciate, again, your, your time to have this discussion. Um, there are many complicated la layers in Minnesota's alcohol laws. The bill before you today um, really does expand the food, it adds a food retailer license, gives us the ability to sell strong beer, wine, and Minnesota distilled spirits. It provides the cities the opportunity to manage the licenses. It does not mandate a change to the municipal structure. It simply offer, offers city and retailers the options to mess, best meet their businesses and communities. Um, with that, I honestly am going to turn it over to my folks because I know we are on a tight timetable and I think it's important you hear their voice, not mine, again. So thank you. I'm always happy to stand for questions. I have more comments, but I'll we, let them get on it. We appreciate that and uh, we agree with your sentiment. There are a lot of people that want to testify, so whoever's next, come on up. And if we can, everybody uh, today can try to keep their testimony as brief as possible. It will help more people get up and uh, uh, get the conversation started. And with that, welcome to the committee. Identify yourself for the tape and please proceed when you're ready. Thank you. I'm Kim McIntoon. I have with me my son, Jamie McIntoon. Um, Jamie's sister, Jessa, is also part of our company, owners of the company, and uh, she's home watching the shop today. Just a little bit about our company. Uh, my great-grandfather started our market in 1900, right at the turn of the century. Don't know exactly when, but best information my grandfather had. When grandfather got uh, married in 1916, great-grandpa said there's not enough business in this town for two of us, so he moved to Waconia in 1917. And we, uh, we've been there since, uh, since uh, to celebrate our 100th anniversary. Uh, that makes us the oldest uh, grocery company in the state of Minnesota, as researched by the Minnesota Grocers Association. In 2016, we bought two more stores, smaller stores, in the south part of the, the Twin Cities, Montgomery and Lonsdale. And combined, today, we have over 300 employees. We're really involved in all aspects of our community. We support our churches, our schools, the 4-H clubs, and more. Um, 
for instance, like a few years ago when Ridgeview Medical Center wanted to put in a heart wing uh, with Abbott Northwestern Hospitals, McIntoon's Fine Foods was there to donate $50,000 to get it up and going. Uh, just recently, the Oconee Baseball Association needed a new grandstand to take care of our town team, our Legion teams, the Oconee High School team, Little League teams, and we were there with $25,000 to support them. And just in the last couple of weeks, our local Rotary Club wanted to send all of our Korean and Vietnam War vets to Washington, D.C., and they were short of cash, and McIntoon Fine Foods came up with $10,000 to help get that accomplished. So we do all of those kind of things, plus we really try to work with our food shows and everything else. And I'm just trying to point out the, how sensitive we are to our communities uh, as retail grocers. But for the last 10 years, we've been doing a golf tournament, for instance, for the Konya Food Shelf. And uh, this last year, even this last spring now, even with the horrible weather we had, we still raised $19,000 for them. <coughs> and in the course of the 10 years, we've raised over $107,000. We also do a stuff a truck program for them for the last 15 years, and we've uh, we've uh, put together 269,000 pounds of food for our Waconia, Nord Young America, and St. Bonnie food shelves. We've also instituted these same two programs in the last two years that we've owned uh, Montgomery and Lonsdale for those food shelves. A grocery is a very competitive business. <coughs> in the early days of my uh, career. There was no such thing as corporate stores. There, there wasn't even Cub or Walmart or Target, and now that they are there and they're all in groceries. But when we started out, it was grocers like us, families, Colburns, Lunds, Byerleys, Kowalskis came along, Miners, uh, all family stores. Now everybody is selling groceries, including Hy-Vee, which is new to our market. Then add to that the Aldi's, the Trader Joe's, the Fresh Times, and let's not forget the Fleet Farms, the Menards, and all the other hardware stores. And then we have the Holiday Gas Stations, and the Walgreens, and CVS's, the Quick Drips, the Casey's, and all the C stores that are selling groceries. And we haven't been able to add too many more things to our, uh, to our mix. Um, None of these competitors ever had to ask you folks if they could sell the products that we built our businesses on or not. But but and we need to reinvent and evolve daily to stay relevant to our customers. Now we're asking you to help us provide a product to our customers that our customers want and your constituents want by a four to one margin, I believe. And Jimmy, you have any further comments? <clears throat> yeah, uh, Mr. Chair um, and everyone else, the, there's a lot of challenges in operating a grocery store. I mean, taxes are going up, health care goes up, labor costs are all going up throughout everything. And like my dad mentioned, with uh, you know, the continuing competition that keeps coming, he left out like Blue Apron, who's also competing for the dollar, and Amazon, which is probably the biggest person that we're competing with. And it's just going to get more and more over years. Um, I get in Waconia, and all over the state there's also like new local breweries and distilleries and stuff like and wineries popping up and we want to be able to help sell their products and things like that as of right now we partner with the local brewery with selling well not selling their alcohol but we use their beer in our broth and we have a, a beer broth and an ultimate broth and several other kinds of broths which kind of help facilitate our um, like cross merchandise, I guess, kind of say with um, them. Uh, we're also looking at doing like a wine brought with one of the local wineries, and we're in the development stage of that. But with all that stuff, it would be nice to be able to have their wines and their beers and all other stuff in store so we could cross merchandise with that. Um, and I'm assuming that you guys have questions with the restricted yeah. stuff on grocery stores being able to sell, you know. That and kind of stuff. We already have cigarettes and fireworks and lottery that, you know, we do a good job with maintaining <coughs> selling, you know, to underage people. So, and also with, we used to sell the 3-2 beer, but with the Sunday liquor sales, we have discontinued that because that was really the only day that we were selling it. So. Mr. Charles, say sadly that there were no samples of the brats 
brought down here this morning, but <laughs> we'll work on that next year. Thank you, Representative Nash. Mr. McAthune, thank you. Nice job. And could you just identify yourself for the tape? We know who you are, but just. Oh, <coughs> Jamie McAthune. Thank you. And Representative Krisha had a question for you. Nope, they oh, answered it. You got it. Okay, thank you. Um, gentlemen, thank you. Whoever's. Oh, Representative. Not of them. Okay, Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you uh, use cigarettes as the example of how you've done a good job with not selling to minors. Um, every retail store that I've gone to has cig have cigarettes behind the counter where there is someone who then cards that person right then and there. Um, every proposal that I've seen for wine and grocery stores or liquor and um, other retail establishments do not propose to have it behind the counter, but to have it on the shelf along with every other. Um, what do you think about um, people's concerns about access, right? That if it's just on the shelf, that um, young people have access to it. Well, Mr. Prior, prior to us pulling off the 3-2 off of our shelves, we had that on the regular shelf that we were selling to only people of age. But tobacco, and I, I'm not sure about 3-2 beer, but I know with tobacco we have, we're always tested out by the government with stings. You know, and they bring in people that are underage, but they look like they're 23, and try to buy tobacco, and we have never failed this thing yet. And fireworks are also out on the floor, too. I'm sorry? Fireworks are also out on the floor. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, whoever is up next, we had uh, Chris Kowalski. <laughs> Representative David. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This question is to Mr. Clayman. Uh, is there any compensation for the small mom and pop shops and the munis will be put out of business with this bill? Mr. Clayman. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Davids, uh, there are not no provisions like that in uh, this draft. Okay, Representative Because Mr. Chairman and members, we pass this every muni and every small mom and pop liquor store is out of business. And we can say, well, it's just Minnesota made and so forth. But that's today. Uh, we, we know where this is headed. So I think we need to have the debate of do we just shut down munis and small mom and pop shops and just market through the grocery stores and the sea stores? Because that's where it's headed. So we could cut a lot of pain and heartache if we are just honest and say, we want to shut down the mom and pop shops and the munis. That's what this is about. Let's get it. So I don't know if we can have an amendment to have some compensation to all those small businesses in my district that are put out of business. But that's probably for further discussion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative David's good question. Uh, that is for further discussion. We're not moving a bill today. We're just uh, starting the discussion. Um, Ms. Kowalski, welcome to the committee. Please proceed when you're ready. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for having me uh, be part of this process. I really appreciate the time. Um, again, my parents started this business in 1983, Jim and Mary Ann Kowalski, so I'm second generation leader of Kowalski's Markets at this point. Um, and I see us as a mom and pop. Quite honestly, we are a small local neighborhood business. We have 11 Kowalski stores that took us 30 some odd years to build. Uh, we have been a good community member. I'm not gonna, much like McIntoons, we, I think the local grocer has just uh, in historically been that person or that business that's really engaged with the community, with churches, with schools. Uh, with, with uh, we were one of the, actually the first retailer to build up the Second Harvest Heartland uh, food program with them. Uh, we give them a, a pound, millions of pounds of food uh, every year. Uh, so, you know, with that being said, uh, we do need some help as well as a mom and pop with continuing to be competitive in this marketplace. I think allowing ourselves I, I sort of see ourselves as a food and beverage purveyor anyway. So I see this as a natural evolution of the Minnesota marketplace for a grocer. I don't know that it's, his, that it's this historical uh, uh, challenge or change. I think it's been happening all over the nation. I think that um, it just makes sense for Minnesota to get there. Uh, to the point of putting mom and pops out of the business, obviously being one of those, that is not our intention. I do not see that that would happen. We have had liquor stores now attached to our grocery stores since 2008. Um, and we had to do that in order to compete and stay relevant. So we're fighting to stay relevant in this competitive landscape just as much as everybody else who owns a business today. And it has 
based on what McIntoon says, it is harder and harder. But we're committed to our family organizations and we want to be here. And we want to continue to employ 1,600 people. We're proud of that. And uh, so with that being said, there's been many liquor stores that are in close proximity, proximity that are still engaged in business and very successful with us having the, the uh, addition of liquor stores to our markets. So um, I guess with all that being said, I'm probably forgetting something. But if you have any questions, please feel free. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Ms. Kowalski. Um, up next, uh, Dana Glade from Jerry's Foods. Can I have a question? Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, the attachment of uh, liquor stores to these grocery stores bring up a really uh, good point and so I want to ask a question about the bill so people who are attached to grocery stores um, as a separate business with a separate entrance if they then bring the um, liquor inside the grocery store would the attached liquor store also be uh, bound by this only Minnesota only product or would they still get to sell the products they are to get to sell um, Representative Hillstrom I think that depends on the individual legislation I don't think that's in this legislation and that would be up for uh, future legislatures to decide. Another friendly amendment. This is going well. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Glade, welcome. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of HF 4152. My name is Dana Glade. I'm the Director of Retail Operations for Jerry's Enterprises. Jerry's owns and operates 21 stores, supermarkets in Minnesota under the Cub Foods County Market and Jerry's Foods banners as well as four Cub Liquor stores and one Jerry's Wine and Spirits store. We employ over 2,800 UFCW union workers in our stores, as well as over 175 bakery union members. Um, we also own two county market stores in Wisconsin, one of which has full strength beer as well as a full array of wine and liquor uh, within the four walls of the grocery store. Uh, we are a community-minded operator. We, we support United Way in all of our stores and corporately, uh, as well as participating with other Cub food stores, supporting Boys and Girls Clubs, Stamp Out Humber, Hunger, uh, Masonic Hospitals, and other Cub Cares and Cub Kindness programs. Uh, we're committed to serving the customers in the wide variety of areas which we serve within the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, suburban and rural areas as well. We strive to provide the ultimate inconvenience uh, to our customers with an ever-changing variety of services um, to meet their needs and to also ensure that we are sustainable and able to stay in business. As an industry, supermarkets have been taking hit after hit from big box stores, club stores, online outlets such as Amazon, as well as non-conventional competitors such as convenience stores, uh, gas stations, home improvement stores, and even farm and home stores. These other channels are selling dry groceries, perishable items, paper, cleaning supplies, and many other categories that have been the mainstay of our business. Um, we have no choice but to continue to diversify our product offerings in order to remain competitive. Uh, our customers now have the ability to purchase alcoholic beverages on liquor stores on Sundays, which is a major step forward in bringing Minnesota up to speed with our neighboring states, um, as well as the rest of the U.S. As a result, we have experienced um, additional business in our liquor stores, keeping our customers from having to cross the border on Sundays. However, the states surrounding Minnesota along, allow strong beer, wine, and spirits sales, putting us at a competitive disadvantage with our neighbors. Um, having the ability to offer the products our customers want levels the playing field with our neighboring states. Um, also, online and big box retailer outlets are a looming threat as our ever-changing marketplace. We need to compete. Uh, we are no strangers to uh, offering a full array of liquor, wine and beer, as we are able to have a store within a store in our county market in Wisconsin, Wausau, Wisconsin. We take the responsibility of selling to um, only of age customers very seriously. All of our cashiers are prompted to um, type in an address, or I'm sorry, a date of birth for all age restricted items. An employee who holds a personal liquor license is on duty at all times. In 21 years, we have never had a citation or infraction related to an underage situation in our stores. Our customers appreciate the convenience, variety, and prices that we're able to offer at this location. Locally, we're responsible in our liquor store operations um, with biannual meetings, alcohol server training, and independent monthly compliance checks by an outside firm. Compliance is a priority in our liquor stores as well for any 
age-restricted items in our grocery stores. Our brick and mortar stores are at risk. Um, just look around at other channels that have fallen in our area, um, whether it's toy stores, clothing stores, and such. Alternative competitors are, are taking a bite out of our business. An opportunity for us to sell and expand our offerings um, mean a chance for our survival and growth in locations, including cities with municipal liquor stores. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear today. Uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glade. We've got a couple of questions. Representative Rosenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is either to the testifier or Representative Nash. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Representative Davids. This is a death knell to the single family liquor store. Um, you know, we pretty much dealt them a real tough setback last year when we passed Sunday sales, and I was part of that. Uh, but this is going, in my opinion, way, way, way too far. And I don't want my child to come up to a convenience store, get gas, and go into a store where there might be somebody that is drunk or acting up, trying to buy spirits in what has traditionally been a very, very safe atmosphere. And as far as Jerry's food is concerned, obviously I'm very well aware of you. I think you guys do a great job. I think the grocers in all do a great job. Um, but this is not the right bill to help your business. In fact, this goes against small businesses in a really, really horrific way and will result in hundreds, if not thousands, of mom and pop liquor stores closing. And so, you know, to me, Representative Davis, you're right on. Um, you know, this is just going too far, too fast, and I want to support those mom and pop stores. Thank you, Representative Rosenthal. Representative Anderson. Um, and I apologize if you said this earlier, Representative Nash, but what happens uh, in a situation where a grocery store is open for 24 hours? Uh, are, are the food retailers then bound by the hours that we have for liquor sales? How does, can you tell me how that would work? Representative Nash. Say that again, I, Mr. Chair, I, there was a little background noise, Representative Anderson. So, Representative Nash, when it comes to uh, sale of the liquor, um, what hour, how does it work when the we have laws that say you can't pe sell past a certain point? So how would that work in the grocery store setting if you're open 24 hours? How does that work? Uh, if I may, um, Mr. Chair and Representative Anderson, um, in our store in our Wausau, Wisconsin location, we have a chained off area where we, um, we can resell spirits between the hours of 6 a.m. and midnight in Wisconsin. Um, we rope off that area with and sign it as such. Our registers are locked out from allowing the sale to happen at the lanes, uh, as well as, um, um, you know, we, we patrol the area. We have um, security in the area as well to, to make sure that does not happen. That store is open 24 hours. The liquor department is not. Thank you, Mr. Glade. Representative Anderson? Mr. Chair and Mr. Clem, just for clarification, I assume that all the hours of operation for sale of liquor apply to the food ret retailer as well. Is that correct? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson, that's correct. There's nothing in this bill that provides an exemption for the statutory hours of sale um, that are prescribed in state law, and presumably the local ordinances for the regulating hours of sale would also be in effect. Okay. Representative Halverson. Oh, sorry, Representative Anderson, did you have something else? Oh, just a comment. I can wait till later, though. Nope. Go ahead, Representative Anderson. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Nash. Um, as you know, I, I think that this is something that we're going to go to eventually in the state. Um, and I appreciate you bringing this issue forward. I would probably not have it just limited to Minnesota products. Um, I've traveled the nation and have seen plenty of grocery stores in West Coast, East Coast, where they do sell all these products. Um, I do think, though, with the bill as it's drafted and the fact that you have it for Minnesota products, it's a great way to advertise uh, Minnesota and the tourism that we have here in the state and promoting those local farmers that um, produce these products. So I appreciate your effort. Representative Help. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and um, to the bill author, um, who can ring up these sales um, per your bill? Is there any, um, can any teenager work in the register ring these sales up, or um, would an adult have to ring these sales up? How would that work? Representative Nash. 
Well, Mr. Chair, Representative Halverson, the same rules that apply to selling 3-2 beer on grocery stores will apply here. Um, and my testifier will probably testify to the fact that uh, you have to be able to sell legally in order to be the one operating the register. So nothing would change in that regard. And Rep um, Representative Halverson, to that point, I mean, that's something we're all going to figure out. I mean, you know, if this bill goes forward next year, the next legislature, the people that are on the Commerce Committee next year, um, we can figure that out and work with it at that point. Does that answer your question? I guess I would like to hear from the testifier as well. Mr. Blake? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Halverson, uh, in our store in Wausau, Wisconsin, um, the uh, 18 years old and older are able to sell to our um, to our customers that um, are uh, 21 or older. Um, the 16 and 17 year old cashiers um, will have to call over a, um, a person that's holding the liquor license in the store to approve the sale. Um, they are not allowed to sell to the customers. They don't even scan it. They don't ring it up. They do not slide it across the, the uh, scanner until someone's over there to approve the sale. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Representative Halverson. And Mr. Chair, um, how um, will you deal with um, issues of uh, 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 the responsibility and accountability for selling to somebody who may be impaired? Mr. Blade or Representative Rath? Um, so in our liquor stores, as well as our supermarket in Wisconsin, uh, alcohol training um, disallows us from selling to someone who appears to be impaired of any sort. Um, and uh, we go through compliance training to ensure that they are uh, following those regs and rules, um, if you appear to be impaired, if you are a person that is of 21 years old uh, with underage people or people we suspect to be underage, we ask for IDs for all the people in your party to ensure that the sale is going through to of age folks. Representative Halverson. And uh, Mr. Chair, um, who's accountable if a sale to somebody who is impaired um, happens and an accident happens or they get pulled over and found out they were sold to um, with the impairment. Is that the employee? Does the employee bear some responsibility and some culpability legally? Um, or is it simply the employer? Mr. Boyd. Mr. Chair and Representative Halverson, um, we had this situation in our liquor stores as well as our store uh, in Wausau. Um, our policy as a company uh, is that the, um, the employee that sells underage knowingly um, will be terminated. Um, they will also receive a personal fine, I believe, from the municipality based on the area. Um, the company is responsible as well. So the seller and the company that employs the seller are all responsible for the actions of selling to a, a potentially underage person and the consequences that come with that. Thank you, Mr. Glade. So, Representative Hell. Mr. Chair, I, I guess my, um, I think that um, we talk about selling um, hard liquor, um, uh, wine, and beer in, in a way that um, uh, we only talk about the responsible users, and we only talk about it um, in terms of, you know, it might be somebody who needs um, wine to cook with. It might be somebody who's having a dinner party. Um, but the fact is, is um, when you are in the business of selling intoxicating spirits, um, intoxicating liquors, you also are dealing with people um, with situations that um, can be dangerous for employees. Um, and I think that we need to make sure that um, employees are, are protected in this situation. I um, sold, uh, I worked in a liquor store in college and more than once had to confront um, intoxicated people and not sell to them. And if you don't sell to somebody, um, they're mad. And it can be a dangerous situation. Um, it can be a situation for a teenager, even an 18, 19 year old, an adult, um, that can be very um, difficult to manage. And so as we're talking about um, these laws, let us not um, only talk about um, the, the, uh, uh, the kind of romanticized way that, that people talk about um, 
using uh, wine, beer, and spirits. And this is some, you know, I, I went home last night and, and uh, it's my husband's birthday. So we had cocktails and life was great. Um, but that's not what this business is all about. There's a lot of responsibility that goes into um, running these businesses. And a lot of responsibility gets put on employees. And these are going to be, uh, in many cases, teenagers. Um, and so we want to be sure that we're going to pass a law that's going to keep uh, our employees safe and keep them away from liability as well. That's a big concern for me. Thank you, Representative Helper. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, M Mr. Chair. And, and for clarification, what happens for like dram shop liability, right? Are you serve to somebody who's um, over intoxicated, the dram shop then right has responsibility if they go out and kill somebody. Um, what happens if they uh, sell to someone who is over, you know, who is intoxicated, they go out, they have an incident, someone's harmed. Um, does dram shop liability also uh, transfer to other places as well or not? Representative Nash. Um, well, Mr. Chair and Representative Hillstrom, I would phone a friend to uh, our legal counsel, but also, uh, you know, this is being done now, and that's why maybe I'll answer that as to how they do that currently. Well, Representative Nash and, and members, I think what we're doing here is having an informational hearing. We're not moving a bill today. If we are going to move a bill, we will address all these concerns. It's currently not legal for anybody that sells alcohol to sell to anybody that's impaired. Right. We understand there could be issues with it, uh, underage people working in grocery stores. These are all things that this committee and other committees are going to work on should this bill move forward next year. I think these are all good questions and valid concerns. Uh, with looking at the clock, we have a lot of people that want to speak in opposition to the bill, and I think we should get to those people. Uh, having said that, are there any other questions immediately? Representative Cresha, did you? Rep you? Representative Davids? Well, I'll pass on what I was going to say, but I just think this bill would, it, I know it's not moving today, but this would have to come to tax committee, so just let's keep that in mind. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, members. And with that, well, Mr. Reich, if you want to come down. Uh, and Mr. Chair, as Mr. Reich is coming down, I will say to the committee members, you know, the, to your point, these are all things that if this were to be a bill next year, I'm happy to work on it with you, even if I'm the author. So uh, you know that I've been very open in, the, in uh, my history here, and if you have concerns, uh, I'm happy to work with you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Mr. Reich, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is John Reich. I'm with Winthrop & Weinstein Law Firm. We represent the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, or DISCUS, the trade association comprised of the manufacturers of distilled spirits in the United States. We are testifying on behalf of DISCUS in opposition to House File 4152 today for the following reasons. First, as presently constructed in the bill, it only allows for the sale of spirits manufactured in Minnesota. We believe that this is unconstitutional and unconstitutionally infringes on interstate commerce, thus violating the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. And to the degree that issue is rectified via amendment in the bill um, and, and spirits of any origin are allowed for sale, then we would also believe that it will reduce selection to consumers of spirits. As many of you know, various spirits are undergoing a resurgence in, in interest and sales in the United States, and in fact, the world consumers are buying and enjoying a wide variety of products, and Minnesota consumers have access to a wider array of different types of spirits than they have ever had before. In other states, most notably Tennessee, where laws have passed allowing grocery stores to sell spirits, we've seen the selection of spirits decrease dramatically. Traditional family-owned liquor stores have gone out of business, and grocery stores have not provided the selection that was previously available as they are compelled to sell the most popular brands because they don't have the shelf space for 30 or 40 different kinds of spirits. In conclusion, as currently constituted, DISCUS opposes the legislation, but of course, as always, we look forward to working with the committee, the chair, and the author of the bill as, uh, as the conversation continues. Mr. Wright, thank you. Nice job. Um, with that, Mr. Morrill from Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mr. Moore, we appreciate you uh, having a little hustle coming down. We like that. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Art Morrow, State Executive Director, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. So you've already talked about hours of sale. I'm not going to belabor that. Our other concern area is underage sales prevention. And we recommend, just based on what our colleagues uh, tell me has been done in other states, that people who are underage not be able to sell alcohol. And then that will eliminate the temptation of them selling to peers or friends. So those are our two concern areas. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morrow. Very nice testimony. We appreciate it. Uh, and Ms. Schoenzeit, if you want to come down, and while you're coming down, I think 
you know, clearly this is an issue that uh, should it move forward next year, there are a lot of issues um, that members have brought up here, and I think we're seeing some of the things that would have to be addressed. And with that, Ms. Jones, I'd welcome back to the committee. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jennifer Schoenzeit. I own Zips Liquor Store in Minneapolis, which my father started in 1961. It's a family-owned business, and it's the only business that my family ever has had. I come to you today to oppose the legislation and explain that creating a special law to allow wine, beer, and spirits in grocery store and convenience stores would impact our state in many ways and create winners and losers. Special laws for one group of retailers. Right now, any retailer can apply and receive a license to sell alcohol alcohol off-sale. This means that grocery stores and convenience stores can do this currently under Minnesota law. In fact, many have done so. Right now there are approximately, approximately 135 grocery stores throughout the state that have applied and received licenses to sell alcohol. There are also service stations and drugstores that as well. These are include Target, Cub, Barley's, Costco. Any grocery store, gas station, and drugstore of any sizes and locations, including Julie's Convenience Store in Frost, Carl's Corner Market in Forest Lake, Bob's Corner Market in Boivie, Walgreens in Mankato, Jim's Market in Liquor in Candace, and many more. All of these are perfect examples of current Minnesota businesses selling alcohol under current law. Alcohol is sold in an adjoining premise that does not employ minors, and segregate alcohol from other products. This new special exemption would provide food retailers a special law only for them, while everyone else, such as my family business, continue to sell under existing laws. I urge you to not create a special law for one category of retailers. They already can do this, and why do they want to do more? This also will devastate the small business. Every small business set up and invested in their business based upon uniform set of laws that applied to all applicants. Creating a special law only for food realtors will devastate small business. There are very few food realtors that are small businesses anymore. In the Twin Cities, food realtors is dominated by a handful of large business owners, by publicly <coughs> traded com companies. Similar, many gas stations are owned by very few companies, Super America, BP, Holiday, Quick Trip are our large companies that are dominate. Again, if you remember one thing, these companies already can and complete under the same rules as all other alcohol realtors. Providing these companies with a unique set of rules will harm small business. In conclusion, on behalf of my family and employees, I, are, I urge you strongly to oppose this ill-advised, unnecessary legislation that solely is designed to enrich big business at the expense of small business. It is picking winners and losers and expanding alcohol and it is unnecessary. Ms. Schultz, I thank you. You always do a nice job testifying. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, Mr. Mark uh, Tetro from Legacy Wine and Spirits. Mr. Chesick, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Chair Hoppe and committee members, um, Mark was unable to make it. He's short staff, so he couldn't make it. So I'll submit his testimony after the hearing. I'll, I'll send it off to, the, to, to Ms. Reynolds then. Um, good morning, my name is Tony Chesick. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association. I hear about the tremendous growth in the craft beer, spirits, and farm wineries that have all taken place under the current three-tiered system. Unprecedented growth in these three industries have happened under, the, under current law, and there needs to be changes. 134 and growing grocery stores have complied with state law and have built liquor stores that are in the same building and only a door away. Again, what's flawed with the current system? Countless and growing convenience stores have full off-premise licenses that are in the same building, but only a door away. Again, what's wrong with the current system? The proponents discuss staying competitive in today's market. What community is screaming because their liquor store purchases and selections are being underserviced? What customer is complaining because alcohol is difficult to find? Customers now have seven days and 91 hours a week to buy their alcohol. By the way, Minnesota retailers have been recognized by major and minor manufacturers having some of the best selection of alcohol in the world. Sacrificing all that because large corporations want to saturate all that business and in the end offer less of a selection and choice? The Distilled Spirits Council of the United States has discussed that. Yes, you may hear rumors that 3.2 is going away. If you know that, could you please tell me and the beer wholesalers? Because we haven't, we haven't been told that. If the grocery stores are, are, are surviving and flourishing by selling an average of 3.7 cases of 3.2 beer weekly today, why is there a need to change state law? Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Mr. Cheswick. Um, with that, I think our final uh, testifier uh, on the other side of the bill, Mr. Homer, the uh, mayor of Thief River Falls. Welcome to the committee, sir. Please identify yourself for the tape and proceed. Thank you, Chair and members. My name is Brian Homer. I'm the mayor of Thief River Falls. I've been sent down here 300 miles because this is a concern to our community. I've talked to other mayors from Edina to uh, Roseau to War Road throughout the state, and they have similar circumstances we're in. We have an enterprise in Thief River Falls and Muni Liquor Store since 1947. That's 71 years. During my elected term, uh, elected in 2015, we've transferred $1.7 million to our general fund. Even last year, with a 7% decrease in our sales, we still provided to our under 10,000 population 17% of a property tax buy down. So who's going to make up the difference? Additional community investments are the Bull Ride, River Fest, Deer Hunters Association, Volunteer Firemen, Education Foundation, after prom parties. That's not the concern here. Concern here is that this is a controlled substance that belongs inside of a brick and mortar building separated from groceries and our youth. Our employees at our municipal liquor store receive uh, beverage alcohol training. This is to identify underage drinkers, fake IDs, uh, falsifying um, their age, and also refusal of service, not only to intoxify people, but people that might be bringing an uh, underage drinker into the uh, municipal liquor store. We have a policy that if you bring a, uh, someone underage in, you're not going to get sold that service, and you're not going to be sold the service for the remainder of that day. We, we, we are strongly on within our liquor law compliance. We work with our local law, uh, law enforcement officials, and they too uh, have a uh, feel the need to making sure that we still control this substance. I think grocery stores are for milk and orange juice and eggs, and opening up the alcohol to uh, grocery stores is a real bad idea. Um, with all due respect, if this does happen to go through and we lose our municipal liquor store, I will be letting our constituents know what you have done to us as far as our property tax increase. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Nice job. Um, Mr. Pomeroy. Oh, Representative Loon. I'm sorry. Uh, the Mr. mayor, I had a question for you. Sorry, I didn't see Representative Loon had her I'm hand sorry. up. Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> sorry to make you a <laughs> Just a question. So do your grocery stores currently sell 3.2 beer? They have 3.2 uh, uh, liquor, yes. Okay, um, so they do sell intoxicating yes. substance in your grocery stores yep. right now? Yep. Okay. Uh, just 3.2 uh, liquor. Yes, okay. Yep. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pomeroy, welcome to the committee. Please proceed. Mr. Chair, committee, uh, my name is Andy Pomeroy, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Distillers Guild. We're an industry association of craft spirits distilleries. Uh, our members come from all over Minnesota, from Far North Spirits in Halleck, Minnesota, to Rock Filter Distillery down in Spring Grove, which I believe is Representative David's uh, nine-man football champion, the Lions. Is that true, Mr. Chair? Uh, that's right. Uh, anyway, we turn uh, Minnesota grown grain and Minnesota clean water into some of the best spirits on the planet. And you know, we provide Minnesota consumers with a better tasting and locally produced alternative to the large national brands of spirits that we're all familiar with. The distilling industry in Minnesota has not grown as rapidly as the beer industry, and it probably never will. The regulatory framework for distilleries, uh, as well as just the basic economics of distilling, necessitate that a distillery must sell into distribution. There's, there's just no way for us to make a profit with our cocktail rooms and on-site off-sale alone. Uh, so that's why we appreciate the portion of Representative Nash's bill that would uh, limit food retailer spirit sales to Minnesota-made spirits for small manufacturers. Uh, this will help Minnesota-based businesses ensure that Minnesota consumers come face-to-face -face with our products and not just those large national brands that, uh, as uh, Mr. Reich pointed out, do tend to take up space in uh, other states that allow uh, sales in grocery and convenience stores. Uh, so in Minnesota, we all live within the regulatory framework that you established for us. Uh, Minnesota's got a quite rigid three-tier system that you're all familiar with. Uh, and when exceptions to that system are created, you tend to create an offsetting requirement or limit to that exception. And as such, we feel it's entirely appropriate that if an exception to the traditional retail end of the three-tier system is created, that there be some strings attached to that exception as well. Uh, so requiring grocery and convenience stores to sell Minnesota-made spirits for micro distilleries and wineries, we believe is a fair requirement to place on a retail establishment that a traditional liquor store does not have to comply with. Um, and uh, so with that, I'll just thank you for your time and your attention to this sort of sub-issue within the debate and uh, just 
just let you know that we appreciate any work that you do to support Minnesota's small manufacturers. Thank you, Mr. Pomeroy. Um, Representative Krishna. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Real quickly, uh, Mr. Pomeroy, uh, obviously you've spent more time researching this. They, um, I've been, as, since I've been in legislature, there's like a, definitely a sense of direction with alcohol and all the regulatory framework. What, what do you see going forward? What, what dire where is this all going to go or does it end? You know, we caucus and talk about next thing, next thing, next thing, and I would just be curious to, to get your take on that. Sure. I, I know, you know, this committee and, and this legislature, the, the House anyway, passed some legislation that we supported last year, um, you know, to al allow some additional flexibility on bottle sales uh, for small micro distilleries. Um, you know, those are the kind of issues that we're focused on. I think when it comes to this particular issue, uh, I think for our organization, our sort of overall view on it sort of depends on what other pieces are put in place. And we, we're looking for partners that want to work with us uh, to, to come up with uh, an overall system that works, that grows Minnesota-based businesses, that uh, provides consumers choice. Um, you know, as I sort of briefly mentioned, Mr. Reich's comments earlier, uh, you know, we are concerned about the variety and the selection on store shelves. Uh, we're concerned about market consolidation. Um, you know, there's a lot of different issues that come into play and don't always fit in the exact same bucket on this particular issue. So uh, we think there's some, some changes that need to be made broader than just this issue, uh, if this issue is even one that the legislature decides to go for. Thank you, Mr. Pomeroy. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd like to uh, thank my other colleague, Representative Krisha, for his comments as well. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll explain it to you later. Um, <laughs> just a, a couple of comments as I, I'm listening, and I know we've, uh, as you said, it's just an informational meeting, but a couple of things. The 3 2 uh, issue is going to be real. Um, and, and we have to be proactive to that, as well as the fact that landscape is changing. Uh, we may not like this, we may not like what the effects are, but I believe liquor stores, grocery stores, they're all feeling the, the pinch of Amazons and other moving down. The market's just changing and in flux. So uh, one comment I did ha hear that I wanted to address was that if the 3-2 market is going away, we'd like to hear it. Um, in Utah, in the Salt Lake Times, Anheuser-Busch and Millers and, and Coors have said if this doesn't change, they're going to start scaling back 3-2. That's happening in the market. Um, those, those market indicators are there. And they may not be here today, but uh, Mr. Chair, and with the overall uh, topic of commerce, I think it behooves us to look at commerce in general. And we see lots of market forces happening here. Uh, I, I agree with some of the comments of Chair Davids, but I also know that things are going to change, and I think that by you having this informational hearing and signaling, we have to get this policy right in the conditions that are changing. That's more important than saying we just have to start drawing roadblocks. So th this market's changing. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Representative Anderson. I'll skip. Uh, thank you. Uh, and with that, Mr. Funk, I apologize. Please identify yourself. I Sometimes I lose my little scribblings here, and I missed you on the... Uh, List of people to testify, Mr. Funk from uh, Lunds and Byerly. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity today to speak on support of HF 4152. I'm Kurt Funk, uh, Vice President for Lunds and Byerly's. We own and operate 26 stores in the Twin Cities. Um, we, uh, we employ 4,000 employees across three different unions. Um, and I, I, it's interesting hearing your conversation around the optics of a mom and pop retailer. In our perspective, we are a mom and pop retailer at 26 stores. Uh, we weigh in at a whopping $650 million in annual sales. Most grocery retailers, if they incurred a 12 to 15% hit to their top line sales, would actually go out of business. Kind of an unknown fact. So when we're competing with folks like Amazon, who buy uh, an organization like Whole Foods, 450 plus stores, and the debate is whether or not they're going to actually run them as grocery stores or use those as distribution centers. It's frightening out there. So I would ask you to think about your optics on what a small mom and pop retailer actually looks like. Um, we spend something in the neighborhood of 18 to $20 million a year in CapEx in the Twin Cities. That money is all typically done by union labor. Um, this year we're opening a new store in White Bear Lake. We'll spend $15 million. That doesn't include the property to open that store. Again, a lot of that work will be completed by union labor. So our investments back into the community, back into our stores, and back into driving the economy is pretty significant. Um, 
talk to you about Sunday sales. Thank you very much for passing Sunday sales. Um, but what I want you to understand about Sunday sales is our sales increase from that is 3.55% on a year-to-date basis since July. We needed 2.6% just to break even on labor. It wasn't about increasing sales. That was a big driver for that. It's what our customers wanted and demanded from us was to be able to buy products on Sunday. So thank you for doing that. But understand that the big windfall that the grocery channel got is not as big as anybody thinks it is. Um, I want to speak to the idea of the um, uh, carding of folks. So we have a very rigid policy as it pertains to, it's a controlled substance, right? So if you come into your store, our store, and you're 85 years old, guess what? You're going to get carded. Um, we're going to run that through an electronic device, um, and it, if it doesn't um, pass, we will not make that sale to you. We do have instances where the, the sale has been overridden. Um, unfortunately, we don't have 21-year track record of not having a, a, an issue. We have had instances where the employee didn't trust the system and hand-keyed it. We've gone back, we've take, taken a statement from that employee. We've looked at the cameras to see what they did. We looked at the transaction. Um, typically, um, if, the, if the employee is in fact at fault, we, um, we have to take the action necessary. There's a penalty that's involved, um, loss of job, loss of pay, a whole lot, a lot of other things. So we take, we take safety very, very easy, uh, very, very, um, it's very important to us. Um, excuse me for a minute. Um, so c consumer demands, again, talked a lot about that. Um, consumers are shifting all the time. There were $1,800 $1, stores that opened up in the U.S. last year. These are all folks that are out there taking a piece of the business from the grocery retailer. So um, think about that 15%. Think about the impact. It doesn't take much to give up 15% of your business. Um, uh, a road closure can shut down a retailer if it's gone on for long enough. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Funk. Any questions? Members, I think we, uh, um, we're normally an afternoon committee. I didn't think there would be this many questions this early in the morning, but um, clearly it's a topic that members have interest in. Um, thank you to everybody that testified for and against the bill. And with that, Representative Nash, uh, Representative Krisha. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And one thing I wanted to ask, I want, you know, we've mentioned uh, convenience stores and uh, grocery stores, but what we haven't done, Representative Nash, how does this affect bait stores, uh, VFWs, legions? I mean, th th this is a lot more wider problem. Is that correct? Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Krisha, yes, it does. And, you know, that is something that we need to address uh, moving forward. And, you know, members, uh, this is an information hearing, and I'm listening to everything that you're saying. If I'm the author next year, if there's even a bill next year, these are all things that we can take up. These are all things that we can... Uh, talk about moving forward here in committee and all the other committees of jurisdiction. Um, but I, I just want to conclude by saying that there's a presumption that we're out to, to harm people, that we're out to harm businesses. That's not the case. That's not the case. What we're trying to do is to be reactive to what the consumers are telling us and still make sure that we're uh, reacting to the needs of the existing businesses that populate our communities because they're our neighbors as well. So I, I just think that's a little bit of a false narrative that I wanted to make sure that I addressed as I concluded in saying thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nash. Thank you, members. And thank you again to everybody that spoke uh, on the bill.